the evidence in this presentation is primarily an adolescent demographic, so high school athletes. Okay, so the objectives, uh, we're gonna describe the different elements of an injury prevention program, the steps required to implement an injury prevention program, and I'm gonna give you an example of one of the more common programs, one of the programs that have been proven to be very effective, the FIFA 11 Plus program. And I <coughs> posting, I don't know if it's online yet, but there's gonna be a worksheet that you can take with you back to your respective jobs if you're interested in using this and presenting it to the administration at your school. So, and then finally, throughout the presentation and uh, at the end, I'm gonna present some evidence regarding static and dynamic stretching. So, first I wanna talk about the benefits and risks of playing sports. There's an inherent risk to, to get injured while you're playing sports, so you wonder why are we putting ourselves in this position. And, and those of us who have been part of a, a team and, and played sports, we know that the benefits outweigh the risks. Uh, here are listed some, some findings in the research about the benefits of playing sports. This isn't groundbreaking. Uh, maintaining positive health behaviors, self-esteem, teamwork skills, improving self-reported mental health and physical wellness, reduction in cigarette use, reduction in or improving uh, vegetable consumption, and then the development of leadership skills, friendships, and discipline. So when you're weighing the benefits and risks, this is something that should also be done after each injury because it, the equation's gonna change a little bit. If someone suffers a very bad knee or back injury, you have to sit back and look at the equation again and see if the benefits of going back to sport uh, is gonna outweigh the risk of continuing, uh, you know, of, of continuing to play as opposed to sitting out. So sometimes if you have a bad injury, you might wanna change positions or just sit out the sport altogether. So we t when we talk about injuries, there are short and long-term consequences of the injury. So the short term, what we think about more often are the you know, loss of time playing, missed practice, missing a few days of school. If you have a part-time job, you're gonna miss a few days of work. Uh, those are the things that we think about most often. And even on a team concept, if your best athletes are injured, you might theoretically lose more in that scenario. The long-term consequences are something I think that we need to think more about, where if you have a bad knee injury, you tear your ACL, or you herniate discs in your back, and say you wanna go into the military, that injury down the road might prevent you from pursuing your career in the military. Or if you have a job that you're doing hard labor and you've got to scale ladders or scaffolds and you've got this injury that started in high school and you're developing arthritis, that injury might prevent you from performing your job or even later in your 30s or 40s, that job, you might have limitations. So yeah, we might not be able to play next week or we might miss our sophomore year, but down the road, there are more implications to that injury. And then as well with, with the social implications with your family, if you have kids or grandkids and bad back or bad knee, you might have difficulty playing or interacting with your children. So a few statistics here, after an ACL reconstruction, as early as seven years after surgery, they're showing signs of arthritis. So if you tear your ACL your sophomore year, you're gonna be in your 20s and your knee's gonna be breaking down already. So that's very significant. That's not a process that should happen until a few decades later. Your ACL injured knee is gonna have 10 times greater risk of OA than the non-injured. And then short and long-term consequences of injury are the high cost of healthcare. So high deductible or co-payments, so you gotta go see specialists for decades after this injury to take care of it, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. So I wanted to include two epidemiological studies to show us trends and rates of injury. The first study, they looked at 100 US high schools, different sports, and they found that there's a slight tendency for lower extremity injury. Football had the highest rate for boys, soccer for girls. Most common diagnosis was a sprain, not, not surprising. But what they did with this, what was interesting, was they wanted to see how many injuries per year occur in the US in high school. And they found about, they took the number they found for the 100 schools, they used uh, some analysis, and they found that there were more or less 800,000 injuries every year. So the reason that's significant, the, these programs that I'm gonna discuss, if you can, they claim to, and they've been proven to reduce injuries by 30 to 40%, 30 to 40%. If you can reduce 30 to 40% of your injuries every year, you're gonna keep 
a lot of kids out of the training room. And down the road, social implications, you're, you're saving two, two to 300,000 people uh, some poor quality of life, or you're going to improve their quality of life later on. So the second study looked at a younger population, middle school, grades 7 to 9, and they wanted to see, okay, is there a difference between the age groups and uh, the sports and so on. So they looked at one school for 20 years. Once again, football had the greatest incidence. Sex match sports, girls are more frequently injured than boys. They found that more injuries occurred in practice than games, and the injuries were less severe than the, the college and, and high school level. Tendinitis was the most common injury. That could possibly be due to an issue with conditioning. But interestingly with this, and as, as a lot of us here know, the treat athletes, these injuries can occur at practice too. So when you're talking about an injury prevention program, you want to make sure that they're prepared to go out and practice also, you know, in regards to being ready and, uh, you know, be ready for games too. So not just let's get the kids ready for the season so they're healthy and they can play district. We want to make sure that they're prepared to go out and practice every day as well. So what can we do? Injury prevention program. So more or less a prevention program is a process of preparing the body to go out and, and, and move or whatever activity it is, even marching band. You want to make sure that the, their joints, their, their, their muscles, their tendons, ligaments, all the other soft tissues, their sensory motor system is prepared to go out and move. Okay, so more or less an injury pr prevention program has different components. Okay, and I broke it down into three different Groups. Uh, so improving neuromuscular control, proprioception, proprioception and balance. So you want to be able to control your body while you're moving. It's not all about uh, who can bench press the most or let's add another plate and, and, and do more leg presses. It's more about being able to control your body weight, control your joints at different angles and have an awareness of where your body is while you're moving. And that's whether you're playing or practicing. So. One of the main parts of injury prevention, and, and one of the main points I want to get across today is the frontal and sagittal plane control when you talk about knee injury. So when you talk about frontal plane control when they're jumping and landing, when they're squatting, when they're exercising, making sure they're not getting a lot of adduction with their knees, making sure with the, the, when they're landing, their knees aren't coming together in the frontal plane. In regards to the sagittal plane, that the knees aren't coming across the toes. So whether they're squatting in the gym, whether they're landing a jump and rebound in practice or a game, you want to make sure that they're Mechanics are proper and they have good control of their knees, their hips, and their spine. Knee flexion angles, making sure that they're absorbing the jumps and they're using their quadriceps and, and their, their gluteal muscles to, to bend into the movements and not jolting the, the spine and the knees as, as they're moving. So this is something that you can practice you know, while you're rehabilitating almost any, any injury. The, the young girls or boys that have patellofemoral pain syndrome, they just have pain all the time. If you watch a lot of them, you can do a screen. You have them jump off of a box or just go through a ladder and just watch the way their knees move. And a lot of them, particularly if they're not conditioned well, you're going to see this valgus motion in their knees. And fortunately, if you give them cueing and they practice this movement, they can improve it. Okay, so that gets into the neuromuscular control, being able to control your body, being aware of it, and then and, and practicing that and carrying that over into games and, and practice. So improving in or maintaining flexibility is the next point. So dynamic and static stretching. So static stretching more, I think, can fall into the category of a treatment. If a kid has tight, tight hip flexors or their uh, hamstrings or tricep surrey muscles are, are tight and they have limited motion, this is something where static stretching can come along. This static stretching, as we'll get into, and you'll see during the FIFA program and at the end with the research, static stretching before competition is not a good thing and it actually can be a detrimental thing. So you want to do more of a dynamic movement to improve and maintain or improve flexibility prior to competition. You'll see that with the videos coming up. And, and sports specific also, the, the flexibility and requirements for each sport are going to be different. So uh, the, for a, a sprinter, you know, in track, they're going to have different range of motion requirements than an offensive lineman on the football team. Core control and stability and strength the third concept, third part, and we talk about core strengthening, this strength in the core, and this is something that's discussed a lot, but I don't think it's emphasized in a lot of programs. You can see kids that can bench press or leg press a house, but you try and give them some stability, core stability exercise, and they have trouble holding a lateral bridge or lateral uh, or a prone plank. So making sure that both the upper and lower core are strong, you know, the, the lower core being everything between the rib cage, your obliques, your your, your QL, 
your uh, transverse abdominis, you can get into your gluteal musculature, quads and hamstrings, you include that there. Upper core, we talk about the middle trapezius, lower trapezius, up in the cervical spine, your longest coli, longest capitis, from, from you know, cervical spine down to the lumbosacral junction, making sure that you have good control there. Segmental stability falls into that same category. And then anteriorly, posteriorly, and laterally. With the FIFA program, we're gonna discuss exercises pretty much to address all of that. So are these programs effective? Am I just up here talking about something that's useless, you're gonna waste your time, and you're not gonna be able to take it to work? Yes, these are very effective programs. If you're not using one, you should be. So they did a meta-analysis of 10 injury prevention program studies. This was two years ago. And they looked at these 10 studies, all from different authors, a different group of authors studied these, and they took out bias, and they concluded that these programs can really reduce rate injury by 30 to 40%. We're never gonna completely eliminate injury, but I think we all understand when we see some injuries happen that that could have been prevented. If that kid was conditioned better, that probably is something that didn't need to happen. But these programs, with, if, if you comply with them, they are very effective. Some of them claim, you know, and this would be an outlier, that you get 77% reduction in injury. I think that's very high. I think that probably some luck would be involved with that. But all of them, they concluded this, compliance is key. And as we know, when we're rehabilitating athletes, the kids that comply and they come to the training room or they come to the PT clinic and they're doing their home exercises and they're not doing the things we tell them to avoid, they, they do better. You know? And the, even the kids that didn't comply and they still get well, I think we can all agree if they showed up and they did a little more, they maybe would have gotten better sooner or they may have even performed a little bit better. But compliance is key. So. Next question, current trends, what are people doing? What's going on now? And one of the problems with gaining a consensus on an injury prevention program, what the best you know, program is and, and how to, the best way to implement it is, when you do research on something like this, it's a very daunting task. It takes a lot of time and, and it's not easy to do. For example, this study, which was published this year in Sports Health, they looked at 185 teams and they looked at a total of over 600 sessions. So can you imagine watching 600 sessions documenting what you see and then analyzing it. It's a very time-consuming task. Their findings weren't that surprising. The warm-ups varied based on sport and gender, but the observations you know, were somewhat interesting where they found that 6% were doing only jogging, 5% had absolutely no warm-up at all, 10% had only sport-specific activities, which might not be a bad thing. And then this study, since it was more recent, they included this FIFA 11 plus program because this is, a, a get close to saying, the gold standard for injury prevention programs now. So they, include, they wanted to see which programs actually included elements of the FIFA 11 plus, and there were very few. So 8% had one of the exercises, 60% had none, and then only one team is a varsity football team that included an exercise from each of the three phases. So before we get into the FIFA 11 plus program, I'm gonna tell you a little bit how to implement this program, okay? Now you know about them, I'm gonna show you one shortly, but how do you get something like this started? And it usually starts at the top. To get all the coaches and everybody on board and encourage compliance, which is gonna make it effective, you gotta to go to the administrators usually. So whether you've gotta to go to the athletic director, the principal, uh, the head athletic trainer at your school, or even up to the school board, you gotta establish administrative support. And, there's three ways you can sell this. One would be very simply saying, hey, we're gonna have 30 to 40% less injuries. These kids are gonna be healthier. That in itself should be an easy sell. Two, you can go to the coaches and say, hey coach, if we can keep 30 to 40% of our kids, or reduce injuries by 30 to 40%, we're gonna keep our starters healthy. We're not gonna have to go deep, as deep into the bench this year. Theoretically, we're gonna win more games. And coach, that's good job security for you. You know, you might be able to keep your job a little longer. We win more games. That's selling point two. And then third, if you have to go up above them, you go to the, you know, go up to the school board and say, hey, look, we're paying a lot of money for the, the school insurance. I've talked to a few people, and the, the, the cost of these school insurances can vary. I think there's a, a, someone out there, part of the, one of the insurance companies, they have more information on this than, than I do, but I've heard anywhere from $50,000 to $500,000 a year for these policies, depending on the type of the size of the school. So that's a lot of money. So if you can, reduce the number of injuries by 30 to 40%, even 20% every year. If you do that three years in a row, you could probably go to the insurance company and say, hey, we're doing this, we're implementing it, here's a proof that we're implementing it, we're, we're showing less injuries than the other school, 
give us ten, twenty thousand dollars off this policy. Maybe we can save some money, put it into the athletic department, give it somewhere else in the school. That should be a selling point as well. So after you establish administrative support, you've got to develop a team that's going to carry it out. And that's mainly going to fall on you, the athletic trainers, to do most of the work. The coaches are going to need to buy into it. The parents possibly, and I think the team captains are going to be an important part of this too in regards to compliance. So once you develop a team, you've got to identify barriers. Some of you, you only have you know, one athletic trainer at your school. So a barrier might be personnel. How are we going to implement this? So there's only one of me and we've got 10 teams. How are we going to do this? And time also, you know, we don't have the time to, to teach everybody this, you know, what are we going to do? So you ident identify the barriers and come up with possible solutions. Then you go find the program that you want to do. I'm going to demonstrate the FIFA 11 Plus today. You can take parts of this with you. You can use the whole thing. You can develop your own based on the needs of your athletes, but you're going to maybe use some evidence to help make the program more effective. Then you train the trainers and the users. So you can do that work workshops, handouts, web-based material. And like I said, there's a packet that I, is a, that I put online to help you guys make this easier to implement. And the, the FIFA 11 Plus manual is 70 pages. And I think if you start handing that to coaches or administrators and saying, hey, this is what we're going to do, they're not going to want to read through this. So I, I broke it down and simplified it. And I think it's 17 pages, which is still a lot, but there are a lot of pictures in there too. So, but that's something you can use. And if you have a workshop, this is something you can easily hand all your coaches and say, hey, this is what you're going to do. Based on the packet that I provided, this is something that anyone can carry out. And then the last two are just talking about measuring compliance and then an exit strategy. Seeing who complied and if they didn't comply, why, and then find ways to make it better for the following year. Okay, so the FIFA 11 plus program. So what is this? How many people here have heard of this? A show of hands. Does anybody use it? Cool. We got one, one person. Okay, good. So this was developed by three different groups of experts, some from FIFA, some from Norway and some from California. So they got together and say, hey, how are we going to reduce soccer injuries? And all this is a FIFA 11 plus program. This can be used for most other sports. And you'll see while we go through these videos why. It's a really cool program. It, common movements that are done in most sports. There's a core and plyometric phase that, that can carry over to all sports. And you don't need any equipment for it. And you only need 15 to 20 minutes to carry it out. So this is something that, uh, like I said, no equipment short, common 15, 20 minute warm up. You can do a couple times a week. And even for the games, uh, before games, they recommend maybe only doing the first and third phase, so even shorter. So if you come out at halftime of a football game, you run through it again, halftime soccer, so on, maybe even basketball as well. So emphasis on neuromuscular control and proper mechanics, you'll see that shortly. Once again, this is developed for soccer, but has been proven for effective in other sports such as basketball and football as well. So it was originally called, it's called the FIFA 11. There are 15 exercises, but it was based off the FIFA 11 program they made originally that just didn't go well. There were 11 exercises in the original program. They carried it out, they did some research, and uh, the compliance was poor, and they didn't get good outcomes. And if you ever go online, you look at it, and you'll see why. The exercises just aren't as impressive as this program here. So let's get into this here. It's going to be less of me talking and more, more of the program. So the last slide before the videos. The, this is the setup for it. So you can do this indoors, you can do this outdoors. You need 12 cones, if even that, if you don't have cones at your school, you can use rocks or t-shirts or whatever. You, you line the cones up and rate it A. You have the people line up here, one, half the team here, the other half here. They're, the first and third phase, they're going to be running down here doing these drills, and then they jog back on the outside, and then they're just following through. Part, Two or the middle part can be performed on another part of the floor, another part of the gym, but just you need this much space here. Okay, so the first phase, there are six different exercises. They're all running, okay? And you'll do each of them twice. The videos I included only to save time, only uh, they, they go through them once, but each of these, they'll, they'll run through them twice each, and then they move on to the next exercise. So all of these, and I included this in your handout, Dem uh, they emphasize neuromuscular control. So trying to control the knee in the frontal plane, you don't want that valgus angle, that adduction angle. If you want your athletes to tear their ACLs, you want, you want them to do this, but we don't want them to do that, so you want to avoid that 
We want the knee to be over the, the toe and in line with the trunk. So you don't want the trunk curved. We talk about core control and core stability. Some of these exercises, once they start, you know, not the running forward, I'd hope not, but this, the next few after this, they're going to look a little awkward. But as time progresses, they're going to gain more control of their body and they're going to improve and it's going to show. Okay, so this is the first exercise here. Let me see if I can get this to play. Okay, so this is just simply running. Jog straight to the last cone. Make sure you keep your upper body straight. Your hips, knees, and feet should be aligned. Do not let your knees buckle inwards. Run slightly more quickly on the way back. Do the exercise twice. Okay, so pretty simple. So, hip out. So this time you're starting in internal, you're starting in adduction, and they're running, and they're going to go into external rotation. So we're warming up the hip throughout its range of motion with these next two exercises. Once again, you want to gain control of the body so that you're not side bending. Good control of the knees so they're not going into valgus or adduction. Once again, this is something initially they're not going to do well with, but as they practice, it'll get easier for them. Jump to the first cone. Stop and lift your knee forwards. Rotate your knee to the side and put your foot down. Make sure that you keep your pelvis horizontal and your core still. The hip, knee and foot of the supporting leg should be aligned. Do not let the knee of the supporting leg buckle inwards. Jog to the cone and do the exercise on the other leg. When you have finished the course, jog back. Okay, so the next one is hip in, and the reason I demonstrate that is they, they look similar. This time you're starting out in external rotation and adduction, and you're crossing in. So this is an example of dynamic stretching. We're warming the, the joints up more or less, whether it's increasing temperature and improving elasticity or extensibility of the tissue, whatever it is, we're warming up the joints. So this is the same thing, but just moving in the opposite direction. Jog to the first cone. Stop and lift your knee to the side. Rotate your knee forwards and put your foot down. Make sure that you keep your pelvis horizontal and your core still. The hip, knee and foot of the supporting leg should be aligned. Do not let the knee of the supporting leg buckle inwards. Jog to the next cone and do the exercise on the other leg. When you have finished the course, jog back. Okay. All right, so circling partners. So now we're incorporating some lateral movement. One partner is going to get some posterior movement, the other one a little bit forward, but you're adding another player to the field, so you're, you're training the body to start engaging with someone else. So once again, these are movements that can carry over to, to all sports and not just soccer. Jog forwards to the first cone. Shuffle sideways at a 90 degree angle towards your partner. Shuffle an entire circle around one another without changing the direction you are looking in and back to the first cone. Bend your hips and knees slightly and carry your body weight on the balls of your feet. Do not let your knees buckle inwards. Jog to the next cone and repeat the exercise. When you have finished the course, jog back. Do the exercise twice. Okay, so shoulder bump. So now we're initiating contact. So once again, basketball, football, soccer, there's carryover to all sports, relevance to all sports. Same thing, control in the frontal and sagittal plane. Jog to the first cone. Shuffle sideways at a 90 degree angle towards your partner. 
In the middle, jump sideways towards each other to make shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder contact. Land on both feet with your hips and knees bent. Do not let your knees buckle inwards. Shuffle back to the first cone. Then jog to the next cone and repeat the exercise. When you have finished the course, jog back. Do All right, so forward and backward sprints. That's self-explanatory. We'll go to the we'll watch that video. Run quickly to the second cone, then run backwards quickly to the first cone, keeping your hips and knees slightly bent. Repeat, running two cones forwards and one cone backwards. When you have finished the course, jog back. Do the exercise twice. Okay. Okay, so that was phase one. So now we go to phase two. This is another reason why I really like this program is because phase two has a progression with everything. So these are stabilization exercise, stability, proprioceptive type of exercises. And uh, if you're doing the same routine over the course of the season, it's going to get easy for a lot of the, the athletes. So this phase two has progressions with each. So we'll go through this now. The first one is the, the bench or prone plank. Keep the elbows under the shoulder. I'm not going to show this video. I'm sure everyone here is, is familiar with this. Uh, you go up, you hold three sets, 20, 30 seconds, and you move on. So if that's too easy for the athlete, which some of these athletes it may not be, you then go on to the, all, the progress, first progression. So the first progression I will show is the uh, same thing, but you're extending the hip and alternating between the legs. So you're getting quick contractions, you're getting the hip flexors on the contralateral leg, you're getting the hip extensors on the involved leg. This exercise strengthens your core muscles, which is important to ensure stability of the body in all movements. Assume the starting position by lying on your front supporting yourself on your forearms and feet. During this exercise, lift your upper body, pelvis and legs up until your body is in a straight line from head to foot. Draw your shoulder blades in towards your spine so that they lie flat against your back. Pull in your stomach and gluteal muscles. Your elbows are directly under your shoulders. Lift each leg in turn, holding for a count of two seconds. Continue for 40 to 60 seconds. Okay. So the progression from that is the same exact exercise, but instead of alternating quickly, you're performing about a 10 second isometric contraction. So instead of holding or extending the hip for two to three seconds, you extend the hip you have the athlete hold for 10 seconds, go back down, other leg 10 seconds back down. In the handout I provided online, it, it has all the, the, the duration of all of these, the sets and reps and the progression. So we won't show that, we'll save a little time. Okay, so on to the next exercise, we're working lateral muscles, your QL, internal, external, oblique, paraspinals, the scapular muscles, gluteus medius. So on the side here, you use a short lever arm on the, the bottom leg, so a knee bent. And we're just doing a side plank. This exercise strengthens your lateral core muscles, which is important to ensure stability of the body in all movements. Assume the starting position, lying on your side, with the knee of your lowermost leg bent to 90 degrees and supporting yourself on your forearm and lowermost leg. During this exercise, lift your pelvis and uppermost leg until they form a straight line with your shoulder and hold the position for 20 to 30 seconds. 
the elbow of your supporting arm is directly under your shoulder. Return to the starting position, take a short break, and repeat the exercise on the other side. Okay. This so progression of that, you just straighten the bottom leg out, you're doing the same thing. You turn the, the bottom leg from a short lever arm to a long lever arm, make it a little bit more challenging. Once again, watching the posture of the spine, making sure, and this is one of the more difficult aspects of this exercise when you're doing it in the training room or in the gym or in the PT clinic, trying to prevent this rotation. A lot of times you've got to tell, sometimes it's a good one to do against the wall to make sure that they're not rotating their trunk from side to side, making sure they're keeping their body straight in line, that top shoulder's not rotating downward. So that's the first progression. We'll skip that video. We'll go on to this one. The, the second progression is doing the same long lever arm on the bottom, and they're doing the top leg hip abduction. Very challenging. This is one I use, and I, I see a lot of athletes having difficulty with this, so they usually have to progress into this. This exercise strengthens your lateral core muscles, which is important to ensure stability of the body in all movements. Assume the starting position, lying on your side with both legs straight and supporting yourself on your forearm and lower leg. During this exercise, raise your pelvis and legs. Only the outside of the lowermost foot remains on the floor until your body forms a straight line from the uppermost shoulder to the uppermost foot. Now lift your uppermost leg up and slowly lower it down again. Repeat for 20 to 30 seconds. The elbow of your supporting arm is directly under your shoulder. Take a short break, change sides and repeat. So the Nordic hamstrings curl. So another reason I like this program is, is because of this exercise here. So hamstring injury is common in a lot of the running sports. When you're rehabilitating a hamstring injury, eccentric strengthening is important towards the latter phases of the rehab. They need to have good eccentric strength in order to go back to playing sport without a high risk of re-injury. This is an eccentric hamstring exercise. You do need a partner. I have seen this done with the feet tucked into something along the wall. That's not as easy. The progression with this is just more repetition. So I think the beginner phase, if you can just do three of these, then up to 15 reps for the more advanced part of this phase. Uh, but uh, once again, good trunk control. And right here. Does anyone use this exercise? Show of hands. Yeah, okay, it's calm, good. This exercise strengthens your rear thigh muscles. Assume the starting position, kneeling on a soft surface with knees hip width apart and crossing your arms across your chest. Your partner kneels behind you and with both hands grips your lower legs just above the ankles while pushing them with his body weight to the ground. During this exercise, your body should be completely straight from the head to the knees. Slowly lean forwards, trying to hold the position with your hamstrings. When you can no longer hold the position, gently take your weight on your hands, falling into a press-up position. So, single, so this is going into a single leg stance routine. So this is the first progression. I'm not going to show this video either. You just have them stand out. And this is actually something that can be difficult to someone that does, doesn't have good neuromuscular control. They're just standing on one leg. They're keeping the knee bent. And they're controlling this valgus motion. You see my, a lot of them might do something like this and even have trouble balancing on one leg. So that's the first phase. The second phase is just going to be them standing across from a teammate and they're going to be tossing the ball back and forth. This exercise improves leg muscle coordination and balance. Assume the starting position, standing two to three meters apart from your partner, with each of you standing on one leg. 
Bend your knee and hip slightly so that your upper body leans forwards slightly. When viewed from the front, the hip, knee and foot of your supporting leg are in a straight line. Hold the raised leg slightly behind the supporting leg. During this exercise, keep your balance while you throw the ball to one another. Hold in. Okay. All right, so final part of this progression, you're providing perturbations to your partner. This exercise improves leg muscle coordination and balance. Assume the starting position, standing at arm's length from your partner, with each of you standing on one leg. Bend your knee and hip slightly, so that your upper body leans forwards slightly. When viewed from the front, the hip, knee and foot of your supporting leg are in a straight line. Hold the raised leg slightly behind the supporting leg. During this exercise, keep your balance while you and your partner in turn try to push the other off balance in different directions. This exercise... Okay. So the next exercise, basic squat with toe raise, as they show here, we're avoiding that valgus motion at the knee. So it's a squat with a toe raise at end range, or heel raise. This exercise strengthens your hamstrings and calf muscles and improves your movement control. Assume the starting position, standing with your feet hip width apart and your hands on your hips. During this exercise, slowly bend your hips knees and ankles until your knees are flexed to 90 degrees. Lean your upper body forwards. Then straighten your upper body, hips and knees. When your knees are completely straight, stand up on your toes and then slowly lower yourself down again before straightening up slightly more quickly. Repeat the exercise for 30 seconds. This Next is uh, walking lunge. So once we get into this, all these exercises are good, whether you use the progression or uh, you do a little bit of each. I think they're all good exercises. So walking lunge, this is one of my favorite exercises in clinic. You can get good. This exercise strengthens your hamstrings and gluteal muscles and improves your movement control. Assume the starting position, standing with both feet hip width apart on the ground and your hands on your hips. During this exercise, lunge forwards slowly at an even pace. As you lunge, bend your hips and knees slowly until your leading knee is flexed to 90 degrees. The bent knee should not extend beyond the toes. Keep your upper body straight and your pelvis horizontal. Do 10 lunges on each leg. Is it? That one there, as they show here, and this is, the whole program is you're going to be giving feedback to the athletes as they progress through. Team captains can help you with this too. But this here, as far as you know, screens, whether you're not going to, if you don't use this program, and just watch your, your kids exercising when they're squatting or lunging. This movement here, we see a lot of where they're, they're going to be at high risk for ACL injury when they're squatting in it. This is very exaggerated, but even just a slight tendency, sometimes you'll see it go in real quickly, and it's a sign of weakness in the hip or, or poor, poor motor control. But keep an eye on that movement there, like I said, whether it's with this program or when you're screening kids while, while they're working out. This exercise. Okay, so one-legged squats, the next progression here with a partner. This exercise strengthens your front thigh muscles and improves your movement control. Assume the starting position, standing on one leg next to a partner so that you can both loosely hold on to each other. Hold the raised leg slightly behind the supporting leg. During this exercise, bend your knee at the same time as your partner. Slowly bend your knee if possible until it is flexed to 90 degrees and straighten up again. 
Bend your knee slowly, then straighten it slightly Making more quickly. Sure not going inward. Repeat the exercise on the other side, doing 10 squats on each leg. Okay, so the last part of phase two, the vertical or the jumping progression. This exercise improves your jumping power and movement control. Assume the starting position, standing with your feet hip width apart and your hands on your hips. During this exercise, slowly bend your hips, knees and ankles until your knees are flexed to 90 degrees. Lean your upper body forwards. Hold this position for one second, then jump as high as you can. While you jump, straighten your whole body. Land softly on the balls of your feet and slowly bend your hips, knees and ankles as far as possible. Repeat for 30 seconds. So once again, we're looking, like I discussed, sort of knee flexion angles. So you're doing this on level surface. You're watching how they come down, making sure they're getting a good bend in their knees and hips and they're not jumping stiff-legged. So lateral jumps now. So now you're going to single leg stability. Once again, taking into consideration all the, the movement patterns we discussed. This exercise improves your jumping power and movement control on one leg. Assume the starting position standing on one leg. Bend your hips, knee and ankle slightly and lean your upper body forwards. During this exercise, jump approximately one meter to the side from your supporting leg onto your other leg. Land gently on the ball of your foot and bend your hips, knee and ankle. Hold this position for about a second and then jump onto the other leg. Keep your upper body stable and facing forwards and your pelvis horizontal. Repeat for 30 seconds. jumps here this exercise improves body stability through quick movements in different directions assume the starting position standing with your feet hip width apart and imagine that there is a cross mark on the ground and you are standing in the middle of it During this exercise, bend your hips, knees and ankles and from this position alternate between jumping forwards and backwards, from side to side and diagonally across the cross. Jump as quickly and explosively as possible. Land gently on the balls of your feet and bend your hips, knees and ankles. Lean your upper body forwards slightly throughout the exercise. Repeat the exercise for 30 seconds. Okay, so the last three exercises here, this is phase three. So once again, before games, they recommend just phase one and phase three, all those exercises we just went through. That's not something you necessarily have to do before games. They do recommend this whole program maybe just twice a week. If you want to do it before every practice, that's great. But twice a week is more reasonable in regards to compliance. So this first is across the pitch, they call it. Run approximately 40 meters across the pitch at 75 to 80% of a maximum pace and then jog the rest of the way. Make sure you keep your upper body straight. Your hips, knees and feet should be aligned. So that's the same exact as the, the first exercise. Phase three, you're doing all these a little bit faster. Okay, so this is different. This was not in the first phase. They're calling this bounding. So you're getting into end range hip flexion. You're getting hip extension a little bit Take a few warm-up steps, then take six to eight bounding steps with a high knee lift and jog the rest of the way. With each bound, try to lift the knee of the leading leg as high as possible and swing the opposite arm across the body. Keep your upper body straight. Land on the ball of the leading foot 
with the knee bent and spring. Do not let your knee buckle inwards. Okay, and then finally, the last exercise of this program is the plant and cut, and it's self-explanatory, but I'll show you the video. All these videos can be found on YouTube. These are FIFAs. I think they're the, the, one of the better videos they have on there. I apologize for the monotony while we're playing these. I did have these cut down a little shorter for demonstration, but if you're going to implement this, the, these videos are online. And they're, they're Jog sort. four to five steps straight ahead. Then plant on the right leg and cut to change direction to the left and accelerate again. Sprint for five to seven steps at 80 to 90 percent of maximum pace before you decelerate and plant on the left foot and cut to change direction to the right. Do not let your knee buckle inwards. Repeat the exercise until you reach the other side of the pitch, then jog back. Do the exercise. Okay, so that's the FIFA 11 Plus program. Once again, there's a handout online that will be a good source for you to use and hand out if you do implement this. A few more slides and we'll finish this up. So that whole program you can see include a lot of dynamic stretching. So here's some research regarding dynamic stretching and, and it's pretty much concluded that uh, doing any type of static stretching before games is not a good thing. And it actually can be a detrimental thing. Dynamic stretching has been proven better and it improves muscular performance. Three studies here demonstrate that. They had a dynamic group and then a static group and they, can, they uh, compared uh, performance measures. The first study here, the dynamic group improved quadriceps eccentric strength and hamstring flexibility after stretching where the static group did not. The second study, they found the static stretching warm-up reduced subsequent performance. Dynamic warm-up had opposite effect. It actually improved performance. They called it, uh, consider a re-warm-up, like I discussed, doing something at halftime. And the final study, dynamic warm-up was most effective preparation for subsequent high-speed performance. This next slide, all the studies at, at the bottom of the slide, they found that static stretching negatively influenced performance outcomes. So muscle strength, power production, jumping performance, sprint speed, vertical jump. They're not sure exactly why. There's probably some neural mechanism, muscle inhibition type mechanism after static stretching that causes this. But overall, before games and even practices, static stretching is not good. Where static stretching is a good idea through treatment. If they have tight hamstrings or tight hip musculature, on the side, they should be stretching at home or with you, but just not before performing a, a game or practice. And they talk acutely about that. This study here, the last slide, is talking about, they, they had two groups, a group of wrestlers divided into two, and they wanted to look at a group that did dynamic warm-up and a group that did a static stretching warm-up. And they wanted, they were looking at more of the long term, four weeks later. Which group, not only, you know, we, we've concluded that acutely static stretching is not good. They wanted to see actually between the two groups, would this warm-up actually improve performance measures for the long run? And yes, they did. So they found the four-week dynamic group found Im improvements in power, speed, agility, endurance, flexibility, and strength, whereas the static group had no improvements at all in those groups. So if you think about an injury prevention program or a, a, a warm-up type of activity, it, yeah, we're going to reduce injury and, and, and improve performance, or possibly, but also down the road, there's going to be a, a progressive effect in performance where they're going to do better. So in closing, as athletic trainers, physical therapists, you're going to deal with athletes, you know, of all skill levels and types of coordination. And, you know, you're going to have the good athletes that are they're going to get through everything well, but we've all seen some of these kids that are playing sports that arguably shouldn't be playing sports. And those are the kids you, you kind of want to keep a closer eye on because if you have them do some of these movements, you're going to see some of these high-risk maneuvers in their knee or their spine. So I think these programs, if you can reduce injuries by 30 to 40 percent, there's really no reason why all of us shouldn't be implementing these. Obviously, that the barriers of getting it, you know, changing old routines or convincing coaches or your athletic director imp to implement it might be difficult. But if there's a lot of research out now proving that these are effective programs, if we can keep the kids healthier, I think that that's what we should be doing. So 
that is all. I'll open this up for questions. I hope I provided you with some information you can take back to work and, and maybe help your athletes. Any questions? Okay. Oh, we've got one. Yep. I, I absolutely, yeah. And I, I think not just out on the field or in the court. I think in the weight room as well. You know, you shouldn't be going into these, even the weight exercises with so-called cold muscles. You want to prepare the joints, like I said, for any type of activity that's being done, whether that's drills, whether that's, uh, you know, sports-specific, you know, activity or just general weightlifting. Yeah, I think in the weight room, I think that's a, it's a good plan. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.